Okay guys, this is segment one for our next unit on chemical reactions. Uh, we'll be heading into chapter 11. Uh, this chapter or this unit basically takes us through the different reaction types, um, what kind of reactions we have, how we balance those chemical reactions, and it sets us up for talking about the mathematics behind chemical reactions and how as chemists we can actually predict and determine how much of our products we're going to be producing in our chemical labs. So here we go. First thing we need to talk about is what is a chemical reaction, okay? Earlier in the year, we discussed physical changes, chemical changes, physical properties, chemical properties. So we don't really need to recover that material here. We just need kind of a brush up on that a little bit. Um, keep in mind that a chemical reaction is anytime you take um, some sort of chemical, a compound, an element, uh, and you rearrange the atoms within those compounds. So you split compounds apart, you put them together, you change places, or you reorganize the bonds. And basically what it means is we're moving electrons around in terms of our chemistry. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at is how do you represent that or how do we tell the world what's going on when we're making these changes to these chemicals. Okay. The first way we can do that is through something called a word equation. It's basically a sentence. Um, it just basically talks about what's happening in the chemical process. So, for example, on the screen here, you'll see I have a word equation. And I'm just saying that hydrogen peroxide, and yes, this is, this is the same hydrogen peroxide that you would find in your cabinets and your bathrooms. Um, what you guys get it at is 3% uh, in your bathrooms. So what that means is 3% of it's hydrogen peroxide, and then the other 97% is just water. So when you buy hydrogen peroxide from a Walgreens or a pharmacy, um, you're really buying... 3% um, of the active material and the other 97% is water or a dilutant in there. So you're taking hydrogen peroxide and that hydrogen peroxide actually over time reacts to produce water and oxygen. So if you leave hydrogen peroxide sitting in your bathroom cabinets for years at a time, it actually decomposes or breaks down into water and oxygen over time. It's one of the reasons why hydrogen peroxide bottles are brown because um, sunlight help speed up that process. So what they do is they encase it in a brown bottle, which then you get less light in there, so the process happens slower than it would if you expose it to a clear bottle. So here's our word equation, basically saying I'm taking this chemical, I'm going to react it to produce, and I'm going to say what's being made, the water and the oxygen. Okay? Now whenever you talk about word equations, or even um, word equations that have less structure to them, there's always the reactant side and the product side. So we always first talk about what the reactants are. Those are the things that are going to react. Okay, so I always say reactants react to produce products. Okay, so reactants react to produce products. So our reactants are going to react, this little arrow is a yield sign or a production sign, or it's kind of like an equal sign in math. So the reactants are going to yield our products, are going to produce our products. Okay. Now with word equations, you can write them like this, or you also can break them down into a more of a symbolism or shorten it up a little bit. And this is also another word equation down here, but it's not written in sentence form. So here we're just showing our reactant is hydrogen peroxide. It's going to react to produce water, and then again the plus sign is used here to separate water from oxygen. So we're going to produce water plus oxygen. That's our chemistry that's going to happen. Okay, So these are word equations. If you look at word equations, they provide us the basic information, but they don't give a lot of details of what's going on in the chemistry. Um, it's good for descriptions, paragraphs, abstracts, conclusions, introduction type of stuff, but it really isn't something that a chemist is going to use when they're working within the actual chemistry. Um, for that, we move on to a more full equation, which we use a lot of different symbolism in that. Okay, so here's a table of all the different symbols that you're going to run across in the next few months in our class. Uh, if there's anything additional that's not on here, we'll cover it as we hit them. But um, we're going to walk through each one together. First of all, we have our plus sign. Uh, plus sign is used anywhere in equation, very much like you'd use it in a math class, where you'd use it to separate two different reactants or two different products from each other. So um, it's kind of like in math where you say 3 plus 4 equals. So if we have the plus sign... We see like 3 plus 4 equals 2 plus 5. Very much the same in chemistry, we use the same thing. We could say um, CH4 plus O2 makes C2. 
CO2 plus H2O. So it's used to separate two different chemicals on the reactant side or the product side. Okay? The arrow is our yield symbol. It tells us it separates our reactant side from our product side. So very much like an equal sign, these two chemicals react to produce or yield these things. So here's our divider. Um, sometimes you'll see me actually draw lines between these to say here's our reactant side, here's our product side, and we'll deal with them separately. We will run across later in the year where we have a double-headed arrow. Now that double-headed arrow basically says that the reaction can reverse on itself. So these can make this, but if this was reversible, this could actually reverse and turn around and this stuff could turn back and make this again. So um, when you have a reversible reaction, we get these double-headed arrows. Now also on our equations, we can put in some symbolism for states of matter. Um, these are written as subscripts in our equations. So if you had a solid, you'd use a little s in parentheses, a liquid, an L, G is gas, and AQ stands for aqueous. Now aqueous Aqueous is another way of saying dissolved in water. Okay, so things that are aqueous means that they started off as either a liquid or a solid, and then you pour them into water and diluted them and dissolved them into water. So the term aqueous is dissolved into water, okay, or dissolved in water. All right, now on this equation, if this happened to be, this is methane, so this is methane gas, we have a little G there. Oxygen is also a gas, so we have a little G there. Well, carbon dioxide gets produced as a gas also, and water can get produced maybe, let's say, as a liquid instead. So you see that we use those symbols to identify the states of matter within our equation. We also use a, a, a Greek letter delta. It looks like a triangle. Um, it's a way to symbolize heat or heat energy. Um, this can be found on several places on a chemical chemical reaction. You can find the delta symbol written as a product, meaning that you're producing heat. You could find it written as a reactant, meaning it takes energy in or absorbs heat energy, and you can actually find it written above the arrow. And when you put it above the arrow, it stands for a catalyst. Okay? We haven't talked much about catalysts in here yet. Uh, a catalyst is very much like an enzyme. You guys talked about last year in biology. Where a catalyst, much like an enzyme, speeds up a reaction or helps a reaction proceed. Okay? So anytime a reaction helps um, initiate... Helps to initiate the reaction or it speeds up a reaction. Those are things that a catalyst does. Now, a catalyst isn't needed in the reaction. And the reason why we put it above the arrow is it's not a reactant, it's not a product. So, this heat energy is there before and after. Um, you can also put other things up here that act as catalysts. And that's our, actually our last one if we go back to our chart. So, if you look down here, anytime you write something above the arrow, that acts as a catalyst. Okay? Now, for example, in this example I use Ki. So Ki or potassium iodide. Potassium iodide is a pr pretty common catalyst that's used in chemistry. Um, if you do a reaction with potassium iodide, uh, the potassium iodide is usually there before the reaction and it's there again after the reaction. Now, it doesn't mean it's not used and broke apart and intertwined during the reaction, but because you find it in both spots as a reactant and a product, it really acts as a catalyst there. So we put it above the arrow because it doesn't get made or it doesn't get consumed. It stays there the whole time. So we also would see things like Ki or other things above a reaction as a catalyst there. Okay. So those are our different symbolisms that we can use in a chemical reaction. Now when we're looking at our reactions, uh, most reactions start off as a skeleton equation. Okay, and very much like a skeleton equation, um, or very much like a skeleton, it's just the bare bones. Okay, um, it doesn't provide all the extra detail, it just gives us that foundation of what we have. 
So for example, in our example from the start of this lecture, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It reacts to produce water and oxygen. So the skeleton equation, all it gives us is our reactants and our products, and none of this extra information. There's no talk of heat energy, there's no talk of states of matter, you don't see how it's balanced out, nothing else is there. It just basically writes it in simple form from the word equation, that's all it really does. A complete balanced equation has a lot more information in it, okay? So a complete balanced equation would include the catalyst, okay? So something that increases the rate of reaction but does not get consumed. It would include the states of matter that we'd find. It would include the production of heat. And when we, when we produce heat, we have a term exothermic there. So it's an exothermic reaction. And it includes um, if heat was absorbed. Now in this case, in this particular reaction, the delta of the heat ends up being on the product side because it's being produced. But if we were to absorb that heat energy, we would put that Greek letter delta on the reactant side. And then we would call that an endothermic reaction. Okay? So exo meaning exit or leaving. So you're producing energy or you're letting heat leave. Endo, or going into, means that you're pulling heat energy in. So we get the terms endothermic reaction versus, sorry, exothermic reaction versus endothermic reactions as we talk about our different reaction types. So complete balanced equations give us a lot more information. You'll also notice that now we have these numbers out front, in front of our compounds. And what those numbers are doing, they're, what they're doing is they're balancing the equation. Because the law of conservation of mass tells us that we can't create or destroy mass in chemistry. So if I'm going to make two oxygens plus another one over here, I better have that many oxygens on this side to be used up. Okay, so in our next video segment, we'll go through the process of how do you determine what these numbers are and how do you actually go through the process of balancing a chemical equation. Okay, guys, that's it for today. Thank you.